Welcome to HSC Economics Made Easy. This video is part of a series on microeconomic reform. Today, we'll be looking at labor market policies. As the name suggests, these are policies that are aimed at influencing outcomes in the labor market. These outcomes include lowering unemployment in the long term, lowering inflation by increasing productivity, as well as lessening income inequality. The biggest talking point in labor market policy is whether we should have a centralized or decentralized industrial framework. Simply put, this is a conversation about how big a role the government should have in determining wages. Many students in economics, business studies, and legal studies find this topic to be quite complex. So to explain this topic, I like to use some visual tools and some hypothetical scenarios. Government intervention in Australia's labor market is often in the form of minimum wages and other safety net for workers. When there's a great reliance on the government in determining the employment contract, we say that this is centralized. Conversely, when it is more market-driven, it's decentralized. Some textbooks and websites like to illustrate the various wage determination methods on a horizontal spectrum like on the screen. But I like to use a vertical spectrum as this better illustrates the different levels of safety nets. At the lowest level are the national employment standards. These are 10 minimum standards introduced in 2009 under the Fair Work Act. This along with the minimum wage are the most centralized standards because anybody who relies purely on these standards is relying on a government body such as the Fair Work Commission to legislate higher wages for them. This applies to the whole nation. No worker in Australia can be paid below the safety net. As you can imagine, it is the least skilled, experienced or productive worker who needs and advocates for these centralized safety nets. Now, this is where I go into a bit of a hypothetical story session. Let's say the minimum wage is $20. That is, every worker in Australia is paid at least $20 an hour, no matter their industry and how basic their skill set might be. But a hardworking teacher might feel this is unfair. Why should I get paid the same as an unskilled worker when I've spent four years to get a university degree and work in a much more skilled and stressful job? We deserve a higher safety net. So my colleagues and I get our teachers union to negotiate for an industry award that says we must be paid at least $30 an hour. This is an agreement that only applies to the teaching industry and this higher safety net benefits all teachers. Next, we may have some schools that work harder than others. For example, my school may force all teachers to make more commitments compared to other schools, and we ought to be compensated for that. So, while every other teacher in this industry should be paid $30 an hour, our school union will negotiate for our school to pay us $40. This will be written in our enterprise agreement. As the name suggests, this is a safety net that applies only to this enterprise or school. Finally, within the school, we may have highly distinguished teachers. I for one work extra hard so that I could get band sixes and state ranks out of every student. I should get paid even more than every other teacher in my school. So what I'm gonna do is negotiate with my employer for a contract that is tailor-made for me. I demand to be paid $80 an hour. This individual contract can be called a common law contract because it is negotiated between the employer and employee and enforced by courts in case it gets breached. This is the most decentralized type of employment contract. As you can imagine, this works for highly skilled workers like myself because we have the bargaining power to negotiate for a contract that pays us well and suits our needs. Businesses often favor more decentralized contracts because the workers' pay is more tied to their productivity. This brings me to the arguments for and against centralization and decentralization. The first argument for decentralization is that it can incentivize productivity and efficiency. If there's no safety net, then the only way to get a pay rise is to increase skills, work harder, and reallocate to more efficient industries. This leads to technical, allocative, and dynamic efficiency in an economy. Related to this argument is that decentralization means that employers don't have to pay high wages to workers that are unproductive. This cost cutting along with the increased productivity as mentioned above means that there'll be less wage push inflation. Lower labor costs could also mean that demand for labor would expand, leading to lower structural unemployment. These are some of the reasons for the decentralization of Australia's labor market since the 1990s, including the introduction of Australian workplace agreements in the mid 2000s, which gave employers more flexibility when negotiating employment contracts. In effect, this was lowering the safety net and shifting workers towards more decentralized contracts. The economy enjoyed the above benefits of decentralization, but there was a lot of backlash from low-skilled workers. As a result, Australia had a slight shift back to more centralization as the Fair Work Act was introduced in 2009 and some safety nets were reintroduced. What were the reasons for the centralization? Well, one of the problems of decentralization was that it meant that many workers would lose bargaining power many of these being already low-skilled and low-income workers. So decentralization worsens income inequality, and centralization aims to protect the low-income earners and lessen the wage gap. 
I hope that my visual tools and examples have made it easier for you to understand centralization and decentralization, as well as the arguments for and against them. Next lesson, I'm gonna focus on one type of centralization in the labor market, the minimum wage. I'll be breaking down the short-term versus long-term impacts of changing the minimum wage. Be sure to subscribe to this channel as well as follow us on Facebook so that you don't miss that. If this video has helped you, please leave a like and comment as well as share this video. And I look forward to continuing to make HSC Economics easy for you. See you next time.